Good morning. It's good to see you all, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the party last night. I sure did. Um, we might even serve one or two more beers tonight because we have plenty. Um, so today's schedule starts out with um, Graham Rossier from OCI, who's going to launch the Micro Future, and I'm anxious to see that. Uh, tonight there's a hacker garden. Um, and um, if you want to be part of that, um, we're going to make a board outside for you to write your name, just to make sure that we got enough pizza for everybody. And if you just want to stay on world with pizza, you're welcome to do that too. So, please go ahead. Right, can everybody hear me? Audio okay? Very good. Okay, so... Uh, Hope everybody is wide awake and revitalized after partying hard last night. Uh, that band was certainly rocking the place. Um, I felt the vibrations. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, in this talk, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, microservices and the industry where we are today, and, and of course, uh, Micronaut. Um, that's not so much as a surprise. Last time I gave this talk, uh, we, we launched uh, Micronaut in Madrid, and um, now it's out there and folks are aware of it, but uh, hopefully uh, I can give you a little bit more detail about uh, why it's such, such a compelling thing. Um, anyway, so we'll talk a little bit about how we got to where we got today, um, challenges with building microservices, um, about a Micronaut, and then we'll cover Grails as well. So, um, <coughs> since 2008, uh, a lot has changed. Uh, 2008, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the year that we released uh, Grails 1.0. Um, we had quite a relatively long cycle of 0.x releases of Grails, and, uh, which culminated in the 1.0 release in 2008. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool that Grails is, uh, is you know, effectively 10 years old. Uh, yeah, if you count the, count the age of a thing from its first kind of official stable release. Um, back then, uh, everybody was, you know, building what is today referred to as a monolith, where you build your application and you deploy it to a traditional um, server container or, um, you know, Java E container or whatever. Uh, they were, the technology landscape was definitely completely different to what it is today. You had, you know, you had JavaScript frameworks were in their infancy. Uh, there was no Angular, no React. Um, virtualization was in its infancy, um, and certainly Docker didn't exist. Um, people were. People may have been, been building what we call microservices today, but uh, certainly the concept hadn't been formalized uh, into what it is. So in that period, um, uh, obviously, a, a heck of a lot has changed. Um, and, um, you know, the industry and all, all the, the framework designers um, and uh, out there we have tried to adapt to these changes in that um, taking uh, frameworks and tools that are very mature and uh, attempting them to to attempting to adapt them to uh, what is uh, microservices. Um, the thing is, though, is that uh, you know Grails is ten years old and Spring is even older, um, and they were never when they were built. They were never really designed um, with this in mind. So, um, uh, so you know, no matter how much marketing you hear um, from you know companies out there, uh, it's a challenge to fit frameworks that were never designed for the purpose uh, into a microservice environment. So, given that context, um, you know, you have a kind of decision to make uh, about a year ago. Um, you know. We obviously want um, to build, there's a lot of folks out there wanting to build microservices. So do we, 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 could, we could kind of carry on, could have kind of carried on as we were and um, 
convince people that you know everything is okay and carry on using the tools that out there that were designed, or you can go back to the drawing board um, and start from scratch, uh, building something designed for purpose from the ground up. Uh, and that's what we did. So uh, the goal uh, that we set out for ourselves um, for a microservice framework was to be a framework designed for today's applications. So designed from the ground up with the context of being able to execute um, as a low memory footprint microservice or as a function on a serverless platform. So some of those um, requirements that you have in, have in front of us are things like you want, you want blazing fast startup time uh, from both microservices and also for functions, this is critical. Um, you want um, low memory consumption. So uh, uh, when you are trying to run a federation of microservices on your, on your laptop, or on a developer machine, um, you don't want uh, to have to have 64 gigabytes of RAM to do that, right? Uh, and you don't want it to take an age to, to boot up. Um, so, um, we w and of course for things like uh, functions as well, it's also important that memory consumption is kept low. Also, you want um, as small as possible jar sizes because in reality, you know, um, most Java applications today are 70 to 100 megabyte jar files. You know, when you talk about web applications, um, you know, a Hello World uh, Grails application is about 37 megabytes. Spring is about 32. Um, but as soon as you add anything like functional, um, they inflate rapidly. So, um, you know. It would be nice to be able to build actual services that are small, both in terms of memory consumption, but also in terms of the, the, the binary distribution format. And for that, you want you know zero dependent external dependencies, and you want the whatever tool you're building to be tw twelve factor. So you, you know you want to be able to uh, externalize configuration um, from the environments, and uh, for it to be uh, you know the, the latest. Um, marketing buzzword is cloud native. You want it to be cloud native, uh, integrated with all the cloud services out there, and so forth. So um, we formed a uh, analysis before we uh, undertook this endeavor uh, of the challenges of using Spring and Grails uh, to develop microservice applications, and um, Grails is built on Spring, as you all know. And Spring is uh, a remarkable technical achievement. Um, it really is a, a cool piece of technology. And uh, it does uh, a lot of things. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room has taken time to look at the Spring source code um, or understand what Spring does, but it does a lot. <laughs> and um, it does it at runtime. So. Uh, some of the th these are just some of the things it does. There's a whole bunch of other things that it does. But um, for example, Spring will um, at runtime read your bytecode for every class that is a bean in your application. Um, it's not enough for Spring to just load your classes. It will literally use ASM at runtime to inspect, introspect your dot class files and build up uh, annotation metadata and um, information about your classes prior to lo loading them. Um, the reason that it does this is because it needs to know uh, what classes are present or not present on the class path um, prior to actually loading the class. So, um, so it reads the bytecode of whatever bean it finds. Um, it then synthesizes a kind of parallel mirror set of annotations. So it doesn't actually use the annotations that you define on your classes from, you know, from the normal get class, get annotation mechanism that Java provides. It actually synthesizes a completely new set of annotations that, um, that uh, for every bean constructor field that it finds. And the reason it does this is to support annotation metadata. So 
Uh, in Spring, for example, there's the notion of meta annotations and, and annotation inheritance and aliases or annotation values to other values. And to do all that, it needs to create a completely um, parallel mirror. And it also doesn't want to load the classes in your annotation, so that's why it does that. And it also builds um, reflective metadata at runtime. So um, it, it use, Spring uses um, reflection to do dependency injection. Um, and it doesn't know anything about your classes ahead of time. So it has to go through all your classes to find all of the at ultra wide definitions, all of the um, at value definitions, analyzing every method, every field, every constructor argument of um, every class that you define using reflection. So it builds all this reflective metadata to achieve that. Um, so the issue with this approach um, is that as your uh, application grows uh, in terms of lines of code, um, so does your startup time and memory consumption requirements. Yeah, So a normal um, Hello World application uh, in Spring you know, won't take very long because it doesn't have to do very much analysis. But if you have 20 controllers or uh, various beans and et cetera, or you introduce uh, order configurations, your startup time and your memory consumption goes up. Um, and uh, we've seen this problem impact Grails quite a bit because you know, one of the things, for example, we did was uh, in Grails 3.3, we uh, disabled um, dependency injection for domain classes uh, by default. So you have to, um, you know, actually in Grails 3.2, we disabled it, and in Grails 3.3, we removed the feature. And you have to use events now. And the reason was for that was because domain classes were dependency injection candidates in Spring previously. Um, so Spring would build uh, reflective and dependency injection metadata for each domain class. And that consumed a, a lot of memory, so, um, as, well, as well as impacting startup time. Uh, so folks have seen notable drop in memory consumption in Grails 3.3 just because it's no longer possible to DI uh, domain classes. Um, so that's just one example of uh, this um, this issue. So um, the micro reality is that with Spring and Grails, anything beyond you know Hello, Hello World becomes quite fat quickly. And if you're trying to build the low memory microservices microservice, um, uh, it's either difficult or um, or impossible to to build an application that fits in a small amount of memory. Um, but uh, we were all bought, brought up on Spring and Grails, and um, you know we love the programming model, we love the productivity. Um, uh, so a lot of folks live with it, and they just deal with the consequences of that uh, by, by paying for more resources on AWS or, or, or whatever. Um, but there must be a better way. It shouldn't have to be like this. Um, uh, a lot of people, for example, are also uh, looking at other, thing, other, th other things, such as Go, such as Node, um, such as um, you know, um, other lighter weight Java frameworks. Um, but when you go that approach, you, you're kind of sacrificing all that productivity and, 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 um, and the programming model that, um, that everybody li likes with, with Grails and Spring. So, um, with that in mind, we launched uh, back in March. Uh, we launched um, Micronaut, and uh, this this week we released the first milestone of Micronaut 1.0. I imagine many of you uh, have already been to uh, some of the Micronaut presentations um, at the conference, um, so you kind of had or read the documentation or, or seen the website. Uh, or maybe you haven't. I don't know, uh, but. Uh, yeah, it's out there, and, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it today. So Micronaut is um, designed uh, from the ground up with microservices in mind. Um, so you may have seen uh, that we're ha we're, we've added a little spin on that marketing term, cloud native, in that we're, we're calling Micronaut 
natively cloud native. Um, so instead of being a kind of cloud native part being a bolt-on bolt or an add-on that's added to technology that is 10 years old, we built the cloud nativeness <laughs> of Micronaut directly into the framework from um, the ground up. It's ultra lightweight. Um, so um, we, uh, we use uh, essentially uh, compile time processing uh, to, to make it so. And, and we built it on Netty um, to enable the lightweightness and fast startup time. And of course, being based on Netty, Netty is based on an event loop model. It's uh, non-blocking. So we have reactive programming in uh, Micronaut um, out of the box. <coughs> so Micronaut features both, uh, is not based on Spring. It features integrated um, compile time, uh, dependency injection, and aspect-oriented programming, AOP. Um, it also features both a cl HTTP client and an HTTP server. Um, however, you don't have to use either the HTTP client or the HTTP server to use Micronaut. You can just use Micronaut for dependency injection um, or just use Micronaut for AOP. It's, it's a complete um, application framework and it's very modular. So you can use it how it suits you. So uh, that's probably enough talk. What I'm going to do now is do a um, demo of Micronauts and do some live coding and hope that the demo gods are with me today. Uh, you, you never know with these things. But uh, uh, let's, let's give it a go. Uh, so is that big enough for everybody? Probably. No. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demo um, a Hello World Micronaut application. And as it happens, um, Hello World, you can actually uh, take pretty far with Micronaut and demonstrate a whole bunch of features that, of the framework um, uh, that demonstrate how you can build complex microservices that fulfill the various requirements of a microservice application. So what I have here is an application that I've created uh, earlier today. And I created it with the uh, Micronaut CLI. Uh, so you can set up the Micronaut CLI through SDK man if you have, or you can download it from the website. There's a, on the, on the Micronaut.io, there is a download link. You can download the zip, set it up. Um, all of those instructions are in the documentation on how to do that. Um, and you can do, basically, it's very much like Rails. You can do, there's a, instead of Rails, it's a, it's a command called MN. MN create app, and um, I've created an application using that tool. You can see that um, just like um, Spring Boot and Grails, uh, you have a application class that uh, that you can run, yeah, uh, and you can run it in a number of ways. You can run it uh, via Gradle or Maven if you are so inclined. Um, using uh, Grail Run. And you can also run it by your um, IDE. So, for example, um, I can, inside IntelliJ here, I can run this um, application, and you can see that Micronaut starts up, uh, in this case, in, in 800 milliseconds. Um, so, uh, sub-second um, startup time for uh, your Micronaut applications. Uh, another factor is that the memory consumption of Micronaut is very low. Um, and the way that's achieved is through the compile time DI and uh, annotation metadata model that we have. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, um, to implement Hello World, I'm going to create a controller. Um, we're going to call it Hello Controller. And um, it's going to be an app controller that we're going to map to the root URI. And it's going to return a string. And we're going to say hello to somebody. And we're going to say hello. 
So we don't need semicolons. This is groovy. Look at that. Um, and uh, the hello uh, um, method is going to re receive a um, map to a get request. And uh, we're going to receive a name parameter that's going to be injected into that name parameter like that. So um, if I were to uh, run this application, you'll see that um, I can open this up and go to hello, great conf. And there we go, we've implemented uh, hello world. Probably I can make that a bit bigger so that um, people can see exactly the message. Uh, but there it is. Uh, so, uh, how do I get back to presentation mode in this thing? No, that's not the right one. There you go. Okay, so, um, so that's a basic Hello World application. So, how, how would you uh, test this application? Let's have a look. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and we're going to create a Hello World uh, package. And we're going to make it a Hello Controller spec. And we're going to use Spock, so we're going to say in the specification. And what Micronaut provides is a um, embedded server that you can use directly in your tests. And typically you want to define this as a shared um, Spock variable. So in Spock, a shared variable is a sing initialized a single time for a test. And Spock also has this really useful thing called auto cleanup. So uh, the embedded server has a, clo a close method to shut it down. And uh, Spock will automatically call that uh, at the end of your test. So you can say embedded server equals application context run embedded server and um, test hello world let's, let's write a test for this and see what happens so so um, micronaut also features a, a HTTP client um, and uh, it has a, both a low level client and a decorative decorative client and I, you can get a hold of a reference to the to the two way client by um, doing something like this. Um, and using the URL of the embedded server, I believe. No. Uh, great beam, I think it is. And you probably want to clean that up as well. And what you can do is say expect something like this, HTTP client, uh, two blocking, because by default it's reactive, hello, uh, great, great conf, and we expect that to say something like hello, that's not going to like it, is it? Okay, so, uh, yeah. So let's see how that uh, goes. So we can run this and execute your test. And as you can see, the test executes really fast. So this is not um, like any kind of uh, a mocking scenario or anything like that. Um, what we have here is a full um, HTTP server running in your test and a HTTP client calling, making an HTTP call over HTTP to your server and returning a response. Uh, if you don't uh, believe me, we, you can um, add a logger, uh, level equals trace, name. like that, no? So you can see that um, a, I'm tracing the HTTP package of Micronaut, and you can see that um, a, the client is sending a request to, down here you can see, to 
get uh, hello great conf, uh, it selects the server, uh, the server receives the request, delivers, delivers the response, and this is the body. Yeah, so you full debugging of what's going on there. Um, so that is a uh, simple interaction with our hello controller. Uh, but of course, uh, that's the low-level client, and Micronaut features both a uh, low-level HTTP client, but also a declarative uh, HTTP client. So what you can do is you can say, I, and I'm going to create it in here, you can, I can create a hello client, and it can be an interface. And what you can say is that this uh, client, annotate it with that client, and you can say that the client maps to the root URI, which you wouldn't typically do in production, but it's useful for tests. <coughs> and what you can essentially do is uh, use the same kind of signature, and you can even separate that out into an interface that both share. So I'm just going to copy and paste. So this is my client. And uh, instead of looking up um, the Rx HTTP client, what I'm going to say is um, I'm going to get a reference to my hello client. And uh, I'm going to say embedded server, application context, get bean, hello client. So I've got a whole reference to that. And I'm going to say, hello, instead of all of this business, I'm just going to say hello client, hello, great conf. And um, now uh, if we run this, we should achieve the, exactly the same effect. Oops, uh, I don't need auto cleanup on this. And so I was having problems tearing down my test. Um, but yeah, essentially, there you go. Um, I've implemented a client that makes a, a request to my server. And what, what is happening here is that at compile time, we are creating an implementation of Hello Client for you. Um, so there, there's no impact on startup time, there's no proxies being created, there's no reflection. Um, everything is happening during compilation. And everything I'm demonstrating to you here is written in Groovy, but you can do everything that I'm showing you um, right now in Java as well, or in Kotlin. Yeah, so we support Groovy, Java, and Kotlin. Um, so that's uh, a Hello Client implementation. Now, uh, but obviously this is like a blocking operation. Um, <coughs> you know, the, the, the request will essentially, this method will essentially block until it returns. And you don't really want to be doing that in your HTTP clients. Um, so we have su full support for Rx Java so you, and Reactor and Reactor programming. So you can say instead of a string directly, I want to return an Rx Java single. An Rx Java single um, is uh, a, a reactive type that expresses that a single result is coming back, essentially, and not multiple. Um, it's essentially what's known as a, 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 a reactive strings publisher that emits a single result. And um, now we, what we can say is uh, instead of saying hello equals, so at this point when you call hello, it's not actually going to execute your um, your um, method. It's going to return the single. And until you actually subscribe to that with a listener or something, um, that, that's like a reactive asynchronous callback. It's not going to execute the re remote call. Um, but in, in kind of a unit test, you can call blocking get, and that will um, essentially um, turn it into a blocking operation and simulate what, exactly what we had before. Now, in a, in, in, a, in a normal scenario, if you were calling this from a, um, a controller, you could alter the controller to return a, a single as well, and then do, you know, hello client dot hello, and it, and it would uh, essentially perform uh, a non-blocking operation, and the whole thing would be unblocking. Uh, Micronaut will deal with all the business of uh, registering a listener on your, on your single, uh, waiting for the response to come back, and then emitting the response to the client um, all for you. So, um, and of course, if you know, you can do things like hello client, hello, great conf, uh, subscribe to the result, uh, and the result is going to be a string uh, with the message, print line, 
something, and you know that's fully non-blocking reactive asynchronous uh, programming. So uh, that's all pretty interesting. HTTP clients, um, HTTP servers, tests that execute in milliseconds, servers that start up in in in, um, in around a second. Um, all pretty impressive so far, but what's this got to do with so far with microservices? Um, well, obviously, there's a lot of benefit already there, um, just to be able to do all, all that we have. But, um, uh, you know, typically in a microservice environment, you have multiple um, instances of a given service. Uh, you need to do things like uh, load balance between them. Uh, implement client-side load balancing. You need to discover what those services' IP addresses are. You will have you will have noticed that um, my my application that I have running here. You can see that it starts up on a random port. Yeah, so uh, the port assignment is random. That the, that's the default in Micronaut, and it's like that because the expectation is that uh, in production um, you will want to run multiple instances of a Micronaut application, so in a, and you know load balance between them. So I have some configuration um, already set up in this application, and it basically uh, it's this guy here, which I'm going to uncomment. And what this is going to do is uh, set the console client default zone. So console is a discovery server. Yeah, there are a variety of ways to do service discovery um, out uh, out there for microservices. Um, there are things like uh, Netflix uses uh, Eureka, the discovery server, uh, which is very similar. You spin up a Eureka server instance, and your applications have to register with it and deregister de it. And you have a discovery client that um, discovers other services. Uh, you, you can use DNS if you don't want to use a discovery server. You could, for example, bind as part of your um, ops deployment process to DNS and just do DNS lookups. You could um, use uh, Kubernetes uh, to deal with your service discovery requirements. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do service discovery, and we tried to support in Micronaut all of them. And a the popular way is to use uh, a product from HashiCorp called Console, which is a discovery server, very much like Eureka. Um, uh, that, and of course, we support Eureka as well. Um, and what I have here is... Um, uh, we have an, a native built-in um, discovery client. Uh, and I'm just going to check that I have. No, I don't. Um, oops. I'm going to, and to use it, you have to add um, the discovery client uh, dependency. And, um, and what, what this does is it tells uh, Micronaut where to find your console server. And I also have. Um, over here, a console running. Let's try and make that a bit bigger so you can see what I mean. I have uh, an instance of console ru running, and I, and I ran it by Docker. So the easiest way to spin up console is to do Docker run and expose the 8500 port. Um, and you can install it locally, but you know it's just much easier with Docker. So I can spin it up. That's console up and running. Uh, we can verify it's up and running by go going to port 8500. And you can see this is uh, my uh, console instance in action, um, which with the kind of registry of my different services. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, so. What? So, how do we get um, the application actually, you know, registered with console? So, first of all, you add this configuration, and um, if I run this now you'll see that, um, and you can, you can see uh, it's actually, I <coughs> uh, have the debug output on. <coughs> so we can turn that off for the next one. You can see that when, you, when the application starts up, it registers itself with console, and now um, the Hello World application is uh, registered itself as a microservice available uh, by console. So, um, that is pretty neat. Um, the neat thing is that you can uh, run multiple of these. So I can run a second instance. So now I have two. Um, and the second instance registers with console. And you can see that now there's two of them. Um, both 
registered under the Hello World uh, service ID. That's your service ID, see? And that service ID is taken from, um, in my application.yaml, I have a micronaut.application.name setting, and this value is used to register the service with console. So how do you then, at this point, um, you know, find services? So you can see that my hello client here is mapped to uh, slash, which is basically saying to use it for the current server, um, which you wouldn't, like I said, want, want to use in production. So what you can say is instead, um, I'm going to map, map, map this to a, and if you want to be more explicit about it, you can say ID equals um, hello world. So I'm going to map this client to a, the hello world service ID. And uh, now when I run my, uh, when I run my test, um, it's going to look up the, service, the services that are running in console. Yeah, and you discover them automatically for you. And I didn't enter any, I configure any IP addresses or do anything special. It just automatically discovered those running services. Uh, if you don't believe me, what we can do is um, add over here. We can inject um, the embedded server into here, into the constructor, and we can say embedded server from um, from that port, and we can then um, stop these guys and maybe rerun this application. See that we got them both running, and now we can run my test again. And you can see that the, the test is failing because I've got. Um, which is expected, because we, you can see that the message coming back is it's saying hello from uh, the server running on port 25336, um, which is cool. Uh, but it, what, when it gets interesting is what you can say is uh, uh, hello, like compare the two responses that come back. And what you get is um, that, that also is failing, because uh, Micronaut will transparently and automatically do client-side load balancing between the two servers running in console without you having to like, configure anything specific. Or it, just, it just does it. Um, so you can see that the first request is going to the first server and the second request is going to the next server. If I run another one, it'll load balance between three. If I run, run another one, between four, etc., etc., etc. So you can scale up and scale down your uh, microservice infrastructure just by adding servers and without having to reconfigure ports or anything like that. They register themselves with console. Your application discovers them by ID, and it works wonderfully. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, actually, while I was looking at this, I just realized as well that um, I didn't really demonstrate uh, how um, you know, this is, I'm using, doing everything in a controller. Um, but uh, you know you can also you can also create um, you know other beans. So I can I can create a great greeting service and make it a singleton, and um, you can move this into here like so, and we can move this to there. Uh, Oops, and create a constructor. And if we, you know, want to use compile static to check more thoroughly, we can. And then what you can do is say uh, greeting service, uh, make this final, uh, create a constructor, inject that in there, and do greeting service dot. So dependency injection um, automatically. So all, all, you know, all you, this is constructor-based dependency injection. So I'm defining a, a service called uh, greeting service that is a singleton bean. Uh, I'm injecting it into the Hello controller, and that's being called. Um, if I you know, restart these applications, it will um, work the same as before, just now that we've structured our application via DI in a way that uh, is a bit cleaner. 
controller taking on responsibility, the um, the service taking a uh, completely different responsibility. Um, so th that's pretty cool. Um, that you get full DI, and you notice that you know there will be no de degradation on on comp on compilation t on startup times or anything like that. More services you add, all all DI is done at um, compile time. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's pretty cool. Uh, another thing that you know we're just returning strings um, right now. Uh, so what you can also do is return JSON. Uh, so create a uh, message kind of DTO or POJO object and you can say uh, that this is going to return a message and that this is going to be something like this and that hello controller is going to instead return a message and now if we um, run these applications that basically um, the responses that come back will instead be uh, JSON, right? JSON, JSON data being in interchanged. As it happens, my um, client is still receiving like a string, so it's uh, getting the string back. But I could equally put in message here in the client, and you know check that the text of the message is is the same. So now we're doing full uh, JSON interchange. So that's, uh, I think, uh, I think one of them is, hmm? Right, probably, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, we will kill those. Um, so uh, what um, what we what we can also do is in a microservice environment, typically things can go wrong <coughs> and do go wrong. Right? It's a distributed environment, um, <coughs> and networks fail. Things are maybe restarted, um, and you need a, you need to plan for failure essentially, and <coughs> you know. Most uh, frameworks out there kind of add this functionality as a bolt-on or, or in hindsight. And with Micronaut, uh, we have built in a microservice resiliency features directly into the framework uh, without requiring any kind of third-party dependencies or anything. So uh, for example, and they work uh, the same regardless of whether you return a blocking operation or whether you return a reactive type. So in this case, I'm returning a single. Uh, but it works the same if you return um, a message directly. And what you can just say is that this operation is retriable. So whatever, what, or you can even say that the whole, all of the operations of the client are retriable. And what does this do? So what, is it, what this does is if you look at the retriable annotation, is that um, you can see that it has various uh, members, um, attempts, delay, max delay, and so forth. And what it does is uh, that uh, essentially it'll uh, retry the operation if it fails uh, up to three times by default. You can instead, if you want, uh, customize that. So you can say, I want to try retry five times. And if you know, what, if one of your microservices is temporarily down or restarting or not available, it'll just go on to the next one. So if you have like three or four microservices running in the background. Uh, one of them is misbehaving, it'll fall over to the next one and at the next retry attempt, yeah? because we've got client-side load balancing. So it'll do the first server, uh, fail potentially, uh, and, and then retry on the next server, and the next operation will, will succeed transparently without your uh, consumers you know, noticing uh, other than marginally slower response times until the, the, the service is either removed from the, um, the the discovery list or not. So uh, retry is built directly into um, Micronaut. And uh, it's common as well to, um, to, to, to want circuit breakers. So what does that mean? Uh, instead of a retriable, what we can say here is circuit breaker. So the circuit breakers 
is, of, is often also called stateful retry. And what, that, what it does is um, what you don't want is if the server is down or the, your servers are down for the um, operations for million, thousands of uh, client requests to bombard um, and keep retrying again and again and again and again, even though they're going to fail. So what Circuit Breaker does is um, essentially uh, allow three retries, or, or in this case five retries, and if all of them fail, uh, rethrow the original exception without allowing any new re new requests, downstream requests um, for t for for the configured uh, delay. So the default is 20 seconds. So it'll essentially block outgoing requests for 20 seconds, then allow a single request through. If that succeeds, it will open the circuit and allow all the, all the requests through again. Essentially, preventing flooding of network calls in your in your microservice architecture. Um, so we we implement both support for retry and and support for um, uh, uh, circuit breaker patterns. Um, so that's that's uh, that's pretty cool. Obviously, this is this is uh, passing, so um, no no retry here is necessary. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, in addition, you can we have support for caching, so you can say at cacheable, and you can configure you can configure caches, um, and we have support for fallbacks. Uh, so, for example, I can create a hello fallback. And I can say that this is a fallback. And I can say that uh, like typically you would want a, um, a, a kind of common interface uh, for these things. But I'm just going to do this for the moment. And I'm going to say turn uh, single just new message text. Did I write this in Java? Christ. <sighs> Why? <laughs> Take two. Okay. Fall back. Okay, so it's just there. Turn new message. Right. Sorry, not here. Uh, and that's got to be a single just we can compile static if you want and um, yeah so that's my fallback so now um, I, if I if I run my test uh, I think I have one server running here um, and it will you know um, pass but uh, if if I stop the server I run it again. We're going to probably get some different kind of thing, and you can see that. Uh, uh, sorry, I think that um, yeah, that is not supposed to happen. But um, anyway, the fallback. Uh, what I'm going to do for a moment is just do this to escape from this situation. Ah, I know what's happening. Uh, I am, yeah, my server is registering itself in the test. So that's what's happening. Um, console client registration enabled. False. I think. Nope. Okay, 
Well, that uh, demo is not with me today. Hold on. Oh, not available. Recoverable. Okay, I've got this compile. That's probably the circuit breaker. Okay, well anyway, uh, the demo gods are not with me, but I'm sure it's, uh, it's something that I will work out afterwards. Um, anyway, so uh, uh, that is Hello World, and uh, what I'm going to do is return to my presentation. So the, the Micronaut features both um, Hello, uh, both an HTTP server and an HTTP client. So regardless of how you use Micronaut, you may choose to use Micronaut uh, just the HTTP server part, or you may choose to use Micronaut um, as a, just, the, just the HTTP client. So uh, for example, if you have a Grails application, you may want to use just the HTTP client part, and that will be made possible in, in the future. Um, and uh, it's small. So Micronaut is um, uh, a, the smallest possible Micronaut uh, application is eight megabytes JAR file um, in Java, or 12 megabytes in Groovy. The difference can be explained simply and purely by the size of the Groovy JAR. And you can run a Micronaut application with as little as 10 megabyte of max heap. Um, in fact, some folks have even got Micronaut applications running with seven megabyte of heap. Uh, startup time is around a second. Uh, little, little, a little bit longer for Groovy because of Groovy's uh, startup overhead. But all dependency injection, AOP, and proxy generation happens at um, compile time. Um, so how does this work? It's essentially compile time, uh, dependency injection, and AOP for Groovy. So You'll, if I, you'll see that in my um, example application here, if we look at the build directory, um, which is, I think, probably here for IntelliJ, we are producing um, classes that sit alongside your existing classes. So in Micronaut, we do not modify your classes. Your, your bytecode is your bytecode. We're not doing any transformations to your code. We're not changing anything regarding your, your, your code. Everything is yours. What we do is we produce uh, a set of class files that, that sit and live alongside your, your class files. And you can see that if you open up one of these, like, such as um, the hello controller definition, you'll see that uh, we're building a, a, your bean definitions um, automatically for you uh, without using any reflection. You can see that we're instantiating hello controller, looking up the construct argument, which is another bean, um, injecting it, and, and even the annotation metadata that about the bean is produced at compile time. So all, everything, uh, and we set it up so that it uses string interning, and it's all very efficient so that nothing, nothing is happening, no analysis, no reflection, Nothing is happening at runtime. All of it is produced at compile time via these bean definitions. Um, so, uh, so you must be thinking, no, not yet another, not yet another HTTP server. Uh, well, uh, if Micronaut was just another HTTP server, it you know wouldn't be very interesting, and that wasn't the goal with Micronaut. What we wanted to do is really simplify the problem space of microservices. Um, so what else does it do? Uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So like I said, we like to call it natively cloud native. Um, it has uh, service discovery built in. We have um, console and Eureka clients out of the box for, for doing service discovery. And we plan to add support for Amazon Route 53. Um, it's also interesting to note that Micronaut is built with Micronaut. And what, what, do, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, um, the uh, 
console client <coughs> that we use is is essentially a, a client implementation. You can see a client here on the on the console client. So we have zero dependency reactive console client implementation to talk to the console server that, that I, I showed you that is built using Micronaut. The result is that when you add cloud-related features to your uh, Micronaut application, like console integration or your registration with Eureka, um, you do not bloat your class file, your jar file sizes, because these clients for your things like Eureka and console pull in bazillions of dependencies and make your, your jar, you know, the Eureka client, for example, it depends on Guava, it depends on commons, X, Y, Z, Z. Your jar file explodes as soon as you add Eureka to your application in the Grails app. We have native Eureka and console clients built using Micronaut, yeah? That are, that are reactive and non-blocking, uh, which is, which is uh, pretty cool. And um, uh, we have built-in support for configuration, distributed configuration. Uh, so uh, with console support and Amazon pr uh, parameters planned, we have built-in uh, client-side load balancing, both integrated out-of-the-box um, uh, round-robin load balancing that just works by default, but also we support Netflix ribbon so that you can, uh, if you want to configure different kinds of load balancing policies, so you want to load balance between servers in a particular region, or you want to load balance between servers that are, have the best response times, you can include ribbon and configure it how you want. We have built-in support for serverless computing, so you can build um, lambdas and deploy them to AWS, and we have plans to support um, Azure functions shortly. But, you know, Hello World is just one thing. Um, we, if we wanted to, you know, we wanted to demonstrate more than um, just uh, building Hello World. So what we did is, um, in, the micro, in the Micronaut uh, examples repository, which is uh, uh, here, Micronaut project slash Micronaut examples, uh, we have a pet store example, so you can check it out and you can get the code. And um, it's basically a um, multi-project <coughs> multi Gradle build uh, with a whole bunch of different microservices that are implemented in different languages and using different backend persistence mechanisms. The actual architecture of the application is covered by this uh, diagram. Uh, so you have a front end that's written in React, uh, a Groovy application that acts as the kind of gateway um, it acts as the kind of gateway to uh, the application. Then you have a bunch of Micronaut instances, some written in Groovy, some written in Java, some of them talk to Postgres, some of them talk to um, uh, Redis, others talk to Neo4j, uh, MongoDB, and so forth, so on and so forth. And uh, what you can do is just check the code out, follow the instructions in the readme, and uh, there is a Docker Compose um, Business and I can say docker compose up. Uh, actually, I want to kill that before I do that. Uh, otherwise, that could go wrong. And uh, I should probably should have used slash d. And eventually, uh, at some point, um, the application will become available. And it takes some time to, to, for everything to come up. But eventually you'll have this pet store application. It has a React UI. And uh, some interesting things about it. Uh, the offers are, take a little bit of time to appear. Um, but when they do, and now they do, uh, it's using a server send events non-blocking stream to, to stream data from Redis, completely non-blocking, and show you offers for different pets that kind of iterates on a banner. And you can go into a, a particular pet and you know see details about it. You can make comments, uh, request information. The information for requests is implemented in, in a Lambda, I think, I believe, um, function. Um, 
when it's available, and uh, you can join discussion. The discussion part is implemented with using, using a Neo4j graph database. Uh, different parts are implemented in different areas. Um, and what you can do is you can do things like Docker Compose uh, uh, pause comments, and you'll see that um, you see the discussion part disappears. Yeah, so the the application gracefully degrades um, when you take down backend microservices, um, or you can say unpause comments and uh, refresh, and it's back. Carry on making comments, yeah? So the application demonstrates how you can build um, a microservice architecture where the UI will gracefully degrade based on the health of your backend microservices using React. Um, so it's, uh, it's a pretty cool example, so check that out. And what else? Um, so that's, uh, that's the the pet store demo. Um, so, um, like I said, Micronaut is both an HTTP server, fully non-blocking. We have built-in support for different de databases. Uh, it's an HTTP client with a uh, compile time client that has service discovery by service ID, automatic client-side load balancing, retry, and fallback. Um, the um, we have built-in support for writing functions for deployable to AWS Lambda, Lambda, and they they use very little me memory. And after after warm-up, they they execute in milliseconds. Um, and you can use full DI, full dependency injection, full configuration injection, no compromises uh, when writing your functions. Uh, Milestone one is out now. The feature set is what I've described uh, throughout the presentation. There's a compile time DI and AOP, ATP client and server, service discovery built in. We have distributed tracing support with built in support for Jaeger and Zipkin. Uh, we support serverless functions and automatic database configuration for SQL, MongoDB, Redis, and Cassandra. It already does a lot uh, for a milestone one. Uh, it's on SDK man, so if you have the Micronauts CLI, if you want the Micronauts CLI, just follow these steps here in this presentation, and you'll be able to install Micronaut, create a Hello World app, and and run it. We have a whole bunch of uh, resources available already. Um, we have a Git community. Uh, if you want to join and chat and suggest ideas or have questions, the user guide is out there already. We have a guide section which has tutorials on how to build, uh, use things like a JWT authentication. We have an FAQ. Um, the source code is on GitHub. There's an examples repo. So uh, all of this stuff wasn't there when I when I did the last did this presentation. Uh, so a whole bunch of stuff um, already out there. We have a bunch of events coming up. Uh, if you go to uh, micronaut.io/events. Uh, we have training events and um, and uh, talks at user groups and conferences happening. Many of them happening over the next few months. All of that information is there. The, your closest next talk is Jeff Brown's talk on Grails and Micronaut shortly, which uh, will be going into more detail about the integration between Grails and Micronaut. It's coming up. In terms of the roadmap, um, next month Starstones will be focusing on metric support. So support for micrometer metrics. We'll um, be looking at adding, uh, enhancing the function support to support um, Alexa skills and um, Microsoft Azure functions. We want to add support for message-driven microservices with RabbitMQ and Kafka and or Kafka. WebSocket support and Swagger Open API doc support um, are the major ones coming. So. Um, uh, with that covering Micronaut, let's talk about Grails. So Grails is um, is is awesome, robust, um, and mature, and uh, we continue to iterate, uh, releasing point releases for it. Um, it's great for creating traditional applications, um, and uh, and the fu fundamental fact is that uh, not every application needs microservices. So there's there's still thousands of applications built by enterprises every day that would be better served 
not being a microservice architecture. <laughs> and it's inherent uh, complexities in terms of uh, its distributed nature. Yeah? Uh, microservices, is all the hi is, is, there's a lot of hype around it. Um, but fundamentally, uh, you are taking on additional complexities when building microservices. Make no mistake. So you are taking on a, on a, on a distributed deployment um, architecture. And it, it's more complex uh, to deploy. Um, there, are there are major benefits to it, some of which I've demonstrated in the pet store app and the startup time and um, of Micronauts and, how, and so forth. But um, if, if you're building a, for example, internal app at an, at an enterprise that, that has simple de and you want simple deployment contract uh, requirements of just you know, deploying a single unit and having it run, uh, there's nothing like a traditional Grails application, right, uh, in terms of productivity. So, and you'll also want parts of Micronaut in your Grails apps. So, uh, and Jeff will be demonstrating some of that next. The ACD client, the discovery client, you'll want pieces of those in your Grails application um, of Micronaut. So, uh, Grails 3.3.6 will be coming next week. Um, as I said, uh, the, in the 3.3 line, um, there's measured uh, improvements in memory consumption. We plan more 3.3 releases over the course of the year. Uh, and then in, once, we, once we release Micronaut in, Q, in Q3 is the target, uh, hopefully we make it, we're going to shift focus uh, to Grails 4. And we'll be releasing a Grails 4, which will have a Java 8 minimum baseline, but with uh, Java 9, 9, 10, 11 support. It'll have Groovy 2.5. It'll be based on Spring 2, Boot 2 and Spring 5. Uh, we'll be releasing uh, the latest version of GORM 7 with, um, with optimizations around uh, startup time and memory consumption, and also um, upgraded to the latest Hibernate 5.3, I believe it's just out, uh, but 5.2 will be the minimum. It'll also have um, Micronaut integration, some of which uh, Jeff will be demonstrating in the next talk. So stay tuned for uh, updates on Grails 4 uh, later this year. Uh, so in summary, uh, Micronaut aims to provide the same wow factor for microservices that Grails did. Um, and we want, a, Microsoft, Micronaut is built by the same people that made Grails. Um, and over t you know, 10 years ago when Grails 1.0 was released. And the significance of that is not to be understated. We have like, 10 years experience of building now ourselves in terms of engineers building tools like this. And we believe that we're going to um, uh, deliver an, uh, an amazing experience with Micronaut for microservices. And uh, it's coming soon in 2018. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's all I have time for. Questions? Yes, so we have built in uh, uh, the, and in fact, it's a good place to go to the guides, micronaut.io, and under micronaut security, it's actually one of, the, we have mo the most guides around security. So we have how to set up basic authentication, how to set up session-based authentication, how to use, how to do micronaut JWT-based authentication using JWT um, web token. Uh, how to do that with cookies involved, if you need cookies, and um, implementing authentication based on LDAP and databases. So there's a whole bunch. And this, this, these are all these guides. Uh, Sir here is not here. His, his wife is about to give birth. He, he's phenomenal um, uh, at producing these things, and there's a lot of content on this subject already. Um, so yeah, we, and then of course in the actual user guide, um, uh, in the actual user guide, uh, we have a whole uh, section uh, on security, which talks you through different approaches to security um, with Micronaut. So JWT or session-based or whatever. Okay. Um, speaking of which, I didn't mention the, the user guide. Uh, we've managed to write a 
book on Micronaut in the user, user guide, so uh, there's a lot of documentation there already. Um, so do check it out. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thanks for your time.